punks it's shinobi and we are bringing you block digest episode 265 at block height 679,819 on monday april 19th what is up guys doing good over here how are you janine uh-oh absent i think we're, we're in the midst of a protest to delay the show one more day bueller uh, we might have got a little hasty in hitting the record button before she got back down. Start over. Show canceled. I wouldn't be opposed to to recording a show on four twenty. I'm just I'm just saying. Yeah, I could definitely go tomorrow. I am trying to get through deadline stuff over here. Janine. Oopsies think that is an official tech problems anyway fud what's up with you i'm doing pretty good I had a bunch of sun yesterday it's it was one of those sneaky colorado days out of the meetup and uh the sun would peak and not peak but you know overall you get a bunch of sun even though it's cloudy out it's pretty good i'm jelly chicago is nothing but clouds and rain for the next week yeah, we got really lucky and didn't get rained on. But uh, yeah, there were 20 some people out there. Like it was fucking hopping. And everybody was fine without their mask on. Uh, people were just happy to be gathered. You could you could tell people wanted that outlet. Were people, people observing their proper social distancing? Oh, dude, we were touching on each other. Like it was it was straight up beer and fucking cigarettes over there. I think I'm going to have to report you to the CDC and the health department. Yeah, somebody was talking about how Polis had uh, some sort of directive to mask outdoors or something. And, like, I've never heard of this. I don't think that was a thing, but I think everybody's just done with it. Is That's the vibe anyway. Like, like, people were happy to talk about how they're done with it. I don't even know what my restrictions are. I, I don't even care. Like, I just go out. I go do things. If somebody tells me I can't do things, I tell them, fuck you. I don't even care what the damn rules are anymore. Yeah, I kind of kind of ease back on buying beer, so I haven't detected whether the signs are still up on the beer shop that you have to mask up. Um, I honestly haven't noticed whether the signs on the grocery store or not at this point but i always wear the mask in the grocery store because it seems like everybody does that Dude, i don't know last month me and a buddy were stopping off at a bar just outside of the city limits like every couple days just to have a beer or two in a bar i still do not know if that bar was legally allowed to open and have people inside or not yeah, you know, bars around here, like the bigger bars, were very actively demonstrating their concern. Like uh, you had to do the COVID sign-in thing at a couple of them. And one of the big breweries around here, like in between trading people out on tables, they come around and spray some sort of disinfectant on all the chairs and shit. Like they were really trying to show that they are concerned here. Uh, but then I went back to my favorite bar around here again, and they got rid of the sign-in protocol. That's, that's all done. Um, I didn't get hassled at all about the mask the the time I went back there. The the first time I had shown up there, you know, was uh, going inside to the bar. I forget to put my mask on. I put it on and come in, and she's like, "You gotta gotta have the mask on before you come inside." 
I have never encountered the sign-in requirement, and I would never go anywhere that did that. Like, at this point, I'm just happy the vape shop that I go to for my e-cig juice, nobody cares there. I, I, I don't even have to think about it. I can just walk in. I can buy my shit. It's like none of this craziness ever happened. Yeah, it's like anything else. Uh, if I'm paying for things, I'm definitely going to be signaling with my dollars uh, where where I like the policies thereof and where I do not. The dollar is your real ballot. Yeah, I I was already pro, um, you know, family restaurants and that sort of thing, but I'm I'm double plus pro all that shit at this point. The good thing is, I mean. I have not noticed the places I frequent um, going under around here, but that's probably just because I've been frequenting liquor stores and grocery stores. Yeah. I've seen a couple it's, places go under, but none of the real local places that I'm used to. Yeah, I, I also have not done hardly any eating out over the last year and a half. Uh, every now and again, I've gotten takeout food. I did go out for India about a week ago uh, when a friend was in town, and and that was great. And I'm glad those guys are open. They make fucking fantastic food. Uh, so it, it seems like places are getting by, but I haven't checked in on, on my other favorite Indian lunch spot that's a little bit closer yet. They used to do a buffet over lunch, and it was awesome just because then you get to try like seven different things. And, uh, of course, they stopped doing that at pandemic time, and I don't know if I'm going to get that back or not. Fucking COVID. So I am not quite sure what to banter about or, frankly, what the uh, the listener's reaction is going to be. To like six to ten minutes of COVID talk. Oh yeah, you know, listener, let me warn you: this was not meant to be on the record. I'm just talking here. It was kind of interesting, though. Um, again, I think some of the lockdown restrictions got rolled back in Colorado here lately. Um, interestingly, I knew the date when it was going to happen. And I had made a habit for the, like, the past month and a half, every Monday, I sent an email to the governor's mailbox and said, it's time to end lockdown restrictions, just because I had no other way to get that point across to him. So just kept sending it and I get my form letter back. Uh, but supposedly they finally rolled something back on about two weeks ago, whatever the magic day was. Uh, but to be honest, even though I went to the local papers website and shit, I never saw them put a story up on it. And I kind of don't care exactly what they are. I just want them to unexist. So I don't know if I should keep sending him a, a email every Monday just so he knows that that was a dumb thing to do. The sentiment read at the meetup was pretty anti-polis and pretty anti-lockdown. Like everybody seemed to be sick of it. Uh, people were perfectly comfortable standing at normal distances from each other and talking to each other. Um, people were perfectly happy to, you know, have a beer, whatever else. Like, I, I think people are ready to get back outside. So I can't wait for it to be nice out. We keep getting intermittent snow up here. So there's been an inhibition from getting outside, even though that's interspersed with, you know, great Colorado spring days. So I think once the weather really turns good here pretty soon, and this is the rainy month out here, but when the weather gets good, I think everybody's going to go back outside. We're done with lockdowns. At least for the summer. We'll see. We'll see how much traction they get next time. I mean, dude, you I'm know, still amazed at places that are locking down again just because it's spring, and it's just like, are you kidding me? Yeah, full on idiots. Like two year olds get to wear masks now in Michigan because that makes sense. Good, good job. Uh, any parents of two to four year olds, I'm I'm sure they're thrilled with that idea. Good luck with that. It's a struggle just to keep them in a stroller or something. Good luck keeping a mask on their face. Yeah, so you got that going on. And I've heard talk about COVID, quote unquote, vaccines, 
COVID, COVID gene therapy is getting mixed in with flu shots. Uh, so already the, the path to commercialization is clear. Uh, you will have the option to get flu shots mixed with COVID. One shot is what they're talking about going forward. Um, so I think the pharma industry got to underwrite the flu shot demand here and just burn this into people's minds. So I'm sure they'll be much more profitable going forward. So in other words, Shinobi will continue his policy of not getting a flu shot because I am a young, healthy man. Why the fuck would I do that? Yeah, and I guess that's also predicated on actually having these vaccines FDA approved as opposed to, I would say, uh, authorized. But we have, we also have no idea what's going to happen there, right? With them pulling J&J and what AstraZeneca got pulled in Europe, I, I have no idea where we stand on long-term approval. And that VAERS, the Vaccine Reaction Database, evidently is uh, pretty inundated with COVID um, interactions and whatever so that the media, for whatever reason, is not talking about, though they're talking about five blood clotting cases. So this is interesting. Yeah, I was trying to explain that to one of our favorite goofballs uh, yesterday. Yeah, he uh, follows the science, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, Hidden Forces did a great podcast. I'm going to forget who it's with uh, on uh, climate change data. Uh, that was really interesting. It's the guy who ran point on science under Obama and has had a number of different teaching jobs and an industry job or two over time. And it's, uh, it's great to have some contextualization around how wide the boundings are on predictions that come out of these climate models and what they do or do not mean. And some reality injected in terms of what Earth's climate has done in the past and where we're at inside of that continuum. Uh, it's great that there are sane people out there talking about things and trying to put it into rational context instead of whatever the fuck you get out of the mainstream press that I assume is trying to sell us on some very large public works projects for Gates to invest in or whomever. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just like the entire thing has gone full stupid. Like, I absolutely was amongst those panicking back in last February, March, and taking a lot of precautions because of a total lack of data. And it's like, dude, that was a year ago. And people are still in that like irrational panic mode, just panicking and not looking at the data we actually have now that's like oh um yeah everybody panicking like myself early on we're overreacting the data is in wasn't necessary yeah it's one of those things about science it's empirical so as data comes in you've got to adjust what your reaction take you know direction set by that data is and uh i'm sure we're gonna get good analysis on all this stuff in hindsight uh i hope we get years to test whatever vaccine that goes to non-emergency approved status uh just like we have other vaccines especially before we start giving it to children um we'll just have to see how that plays out I'm sure it is just, you know, happenstance that pharma is basically the largest advertising provider for television networks, and we're in full restate about vaccines. Just like I'm sure it's a coincidence that New York Times sold a lot more papers when they were doing full Orange Man Bad and had uh, a foil, essentially, to get to plaster to everybody. Mm-hmm. So anyway, don't worry. Establish industries, you are still relevant. The internet is not undermining you. The truth, not undermining you. Keep up the good work out there. <laughs> I mean, the, the news said something. The news never lies. Yeah, I'm, I'm still waiting for people to wake up to narrative, some of them anyway. But 
I, I think there are a lot of people that don't know where else to go. Um, you know, they're happy to be told what's going on instead of going and figuring out what's going on. And uh, that's kind of that. They, they don't know who else to trust besides CNN or whatever their favorite news source is. So I, it's hard. It's especially hard to say you're a boomer that's not completely techno savvy or not comfortable, doesn't understand the web, you know, whatever it is. Um, I, I get your pain and uh, I guess we're here to help. If you're my family, I'm here to help. It was one of those fun reads uh, when I was going cross country early last year and uh, stayed with a couple different aunts and uncles and just got to see what technology they still had around and, and what they were using, how they were doing that sort of thing. And say how many people uh, told me they'd never listened to a podcast before, which was basically all of them. But they were all curious about it. They had heard about these podcasts. So it's, it's slow going on tech adoption is what it comes down to. It doesn't matter if it's getting rid of VCRs or having a home phone line or, I don't know, running Windows 8. I think they're just scared that people can fact check them now. They definitely are. Um, they know that they've lost the narrative to the internet. And that's why they suspend people like the guy who runs uh, what Project Veritas and the like, right? Um, they are getting a little bit too much under people's skin and people naturally lash back and try to get them to platform. But we'll figure this out. Yeah, that is an amazing like example of that to me. Because, I mean, in fairness, there have been one or two times I've personally seen where it's like, okay, you are adding framing to something. You know what I mean? But how the hell can you just discount actual video of a primary source stating something directly themselves and call that misinformation? Yeah, it's one thing when you cut clips out of context and try to sell it as news. It's something else when you roll several minutes of video and say, hey, this is just what somebody said. And considering that CBS takes the governor of Florida and cuts him out of context and prevent, presents him to the American people as, you know, in a stilted reference, non-reference copy of what he's saying, how is broadcast news at this point taken any more seriously than what people do on the interwebs. I think we we have a situation we need to get through here in terms of just acknowledging that everybody can misrepresent things. It doesn't matter how official or non-official they are. Uh, we need to be skeptical of what everybody's putting in the hopper. And we also need forums where we can talk relatively rationally about all these things. Yep. People have to stop concentrating on the messenger and focus more on the message. Yep. It's all about the message, people. Analyze the message. Oh, man. It's kind of funny. This was just banter because Janine had to go run and take care of something. Um, and this just wound up being a pretty deep. <laughs> 20 minute talk about how fucked up America is getting. Should have brought a beer. <laughs> I got hope uh, for this. You know, there's plenty of people whose podcasts I listen to that are 10 years younger than me uh, that are just out there asking questions of, of prominent folks that write books or, you know, have opinions on this, write for a paper somewhere. Uh, develop documentaries, you know, whatever it happens to be. And I love that the next gen is just as inquisitive as they need to be and are interested in how people view the world and are happy to talk about things at 10,000 feet instead of putting on a, a color team mask or perception set and going in on it. So I appreciate all you people out there doing that. Mm hmm the only real problem there is the potential for <clears throat> that matchmaking to just get completely disrupted. Like just put that wall between actual 
like investigative coverage of shit and the people looking for it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it's been great to see Substack come up uh, during this and that sort of thing and allow independent journalists to have a way to and a platform to get content out there. But then we see reactions to that and mainstream journalists want to censor Substack and, and try to make public yeah, uh, you know, outcries uh, on their platforms, of course, to do things like censor Substack or seeing Spotify employees pull old Joe Rogan episodes. Uh, just very interesting state of the world because we went from a, a narrative about the news, which is the narrative salespeople, uh, that they were giving you something that was quote unquote unbiased or they were giving you multiple points of view. Uh, inside of a story. And I'm trying to remember what the F FCC doctrine was on that at one point, but we're so far past that now. Uh, we've, we've straight up acknowledged that we go to war for oil and we straight up acknowledge that CNN definitely want a blue team to win. No ifs, ands, or buts. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think it just shows like complete... It, it, it gets a lot more transparent showing what they're actually doing because the problem used to be spreading misinformation. And now it's somehow with Substack, it's like evolved into, well, it's the person now. That person shouldn't be allowed to have a platform. You, you know what I mean? Yeah, and in this go round, it's been especially pernicious with respect to what's been able to stay up on YouTube or not. So you have medical doctors who disagree with various aspects of how we've handled the lockdown or handled vaccines or the effectiveness of PCR testing, say, by the inventor of the PCR test and commentary around that. And you have all of these views shuffled out of the main forum for people to uh, present them and discuss views. So we have been able to see this in real time. I think depending on where you get your secondary streams of information, you may not have noticed some of that because they're just not there for you to ever pick up. If you can't have somebody comment to you about it on Facebook and have that post stay up, then how do you find out about that? Mm -hmm. Like it kind of speaks to two things, I think. <clears throat> then you know, and honestly, we're go we're gonna need to have a conversation after we're done recording about whether to cut this or not, and whether this might cause problems on YouTube <laughs> with all the shit we just brought up. <laughs> but um, yeah, the two core problems is infrastructurally, people need to actually be able to send and receive that information, and then secondly. Like, there really needs to be a digital equivalent of word of mouth that is not dependent on big indexing services like YouTube or Facebook. Like, there needs to be that digital equivalent of <clears throat> you're walking your dog and you, your neighbor's outside and you go, hey, did you hear about this? That That isn't just unilaterally broadcast publicly and setting itself up to just be disappeared. Yep, I concur. The good thing is the web was built for this. You know, you can have your own website, you can post whatever you want. Uh, the question is how we link that together, I think. And who knows if social media as it stands now is even a decent for humans system for us to communicate with each other. We've noticed all sorts of problems amongst children. We've noticed all sorts of socialization problems amongst adults from this. Uh, it may be time to turn the page and find new paradigms for that too. But whatever it is, I am happy that as long as you can host content on the internet, at least it can be out there. And then we figure out how we get people, get it in front of people, get it shareable. Mm -hmm. The whole fucking internet needs some rethinking at a lot of points. A lot of lessons to learn in there for Bitcoin, too. Yeah, I think so, too.
And I appreciate um, the people that are starting to think about this, whether it's Urbit or other privacy focused uh, OSs that allow you to self host services and that sort of thing. And, you know, some of those are in their infancy. I don't think it's fair to call Urbit in its infancy because it's been developed for 10 years. So, you know, there's there's a lot of work that's gone into it, but it's it's still in its beginning stages. Um, I do think things like that are going to be incredibly valuable in the future mm -hmm. like really my only problem with urbit is like why in the fuck are you using some broken garbage like ethereum for the namespace layer but like yeah the the entire idea of virtualizing your own <clears throat> little vm with its own networking stack like a virtual network overlay and the way that um like deterministic behavior and like cryptographic authentication is baked into all that like that is a super promising direction it's just like one <clears throat> i think that needs to nest way further down the stack into the hardware layer to actually try to minimize all of those types of hardware firmware or microcode vulnerabilities that could be used to start fucking with things above that on the stack and then <clears throat> it just needs to be way more generalized like the last time i looked at it it was pretty much just basic um like chat protocols and like web protocols um implemented and like nothing really generalized to the point that you can throw the script kitties at it and they can start building complicated apps on top of yeah i was reading through their uh their website explainers on this uh whatever the long path is through their pages the other day uh and it definitely looks like things are slowly coming along uh i heard bitcoin sign guy talk about how I, in their next development release, I think they're going for a Bitcoin client hosted on Urbit, and then they're going to go for a Lightning client hosted on Urbit. Uh, when you start to get that stuff on there, it, it definitely gets more interesting. Uh, but they have a core uh, that is, uh, what's the right way to say it? It's all functionally programmed, so it'll reproduce a given state with uh, accuracy across different systems which is great mm -hmm. that is the biggest like important part of that in my mind like just the functional nature of everything you give it the same input it will give you the exact same output every time that's just how it works yep that's way closer to say a network appliance type model um or an ideal router type model and i think we need to get there because all the ways you attack code typically come from well it, it gets much more complex the more dependencies you can have in the ordering of processes that get you into a given state as opposed to you have data x you're in state equivalent to x and everybody gets to that same state x off data x um, anybody who's done programming in uh, system uh, type stuff or application, maybe more specifically type development, knows that the ordering of events is your nemesis when you're trying to restore a given state that a user was in or do things like undo redo type operations um, or you know deep link content somewhere in your stack and tell it how to be in in the state it was in a moment ago or essentially just restoring where you were at uh there are plenty of ways to shoot yourself in the foot when you're coding that stuff and we've recently had some better libraries uh around you know, paradigms that get you towards um reproducibility for uh getting into states or being in the same state after a given series of events perhaps they come in different orders and that sort of thing but it's still mentally taxing to figure all that stuff out and uh that's what you got to get away from and functional programming is great for that i give you an input you're going to where the state is for that specific input
Mm-hmm. We'll see how well that particular thing scales over time. Well, I mean, it's a necessary thing. Like, that is just the core of so many evils in the world of computing is that there is so much non-deterministic shit out there in the giant stack of everything. Yep. Also, I do believe we should have a Janine back in a minute or two. You know, I think though, um, I think, I think we're going to leave this in. Um, I think despite this being a 30 minute, um, preface to the main show, um, this is a valuable thing for people to listen to. Although I, I can't quite put my finger on what it is. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know either. It's, it's kind of hard to encapsulate, but I heard it a lot yesterday at the meetup. Um, I think for me, you know, at some point during this whole pandemic thing, I realized I'm a grown ass adult and everybody like the whole world is trying to be my mother. And at this point, I'm, I'm supposed to be slightly past that. You know, if mom wants to say something, uh, I'll evaluate what mom has to say and, and judge it on its merits and see if it integrates somewhere and maybe it'll help me somewhere in my life. But having the whole world want to be the nagging virtue signaling aunt that, you know, tells me I'm doing the right thing here or tells me the right thing to do here and, and make sure to bring that up time and again in conversation. Uh, I'm done with that. It, it's grading. It's not something that I feel like I need at this age. So bring data and let's talk about the data is kind of where I got to, uh, you know, offer value as opposed to offer a virtue signal and let's see where we get with it. Mm-hmm. You got any thoughts on Ethereum 2.0 slash Binance coin coming up in those stacks? It kind of looks like ETH is getting itself disintermediated in, in real time as far as a smart contract platform goes. I mean, dude, I have been saying this for years. Ethereum will either completely implode on itself or it will just evolve into the scripting stack for financial institutions. And I just see right before my eyes that that second one happening. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's no reason that a bank can't come and start Bankcoin, which is a parallel programming platform to Ethereum or Binance coin. could be completely interoperable. It's just only the banks use that, right? Only the banks are validators there. And, you know, if you want to run super trusted smart contracts, you come to us. But here's the end game. That pretty much leads to each bank having their own chain and token and database. And then they can just use zero knowledge proofs <clears throat> to prove things to each other and make atomic updates between two databases. So then what's the value of the public ETH chain again? Oh, I think the ETH chain is completely disintermediated by bank chain. And I guess I see the bank chain as all the finance people get into it together. Uh, it may well be they have incentive to run it separately, but when you're running that internal database, why, why would you want to go through the trouble of making it public anyway? It's, it's less secure as soon as you make it public and everything else, right? So I, I see them wanting to keep their model, but maybe having a way for JPM to play with Goldman, to play with whoever else. Yeah, I mean, it solves the, um, the wire transfer problem. Like everything can just be, Atomic and provably atomic between separate like siloed databases. Yep, and I think all of those guys are fine, just like Visa is fine with cutting out middlemen. One of the reasons that Visa is perfectly happy to clear stable coins themselves is that takes all the banks in the stack and like the other three or four people that were going to help clear that credit card transaction, they're out, which means there's no fees to pay to them. There's no time to wait on them. All your processes come in house. And I think the banks will appreciate that too. Mm -hmm. Oh man. Wow. Doge almost up to 40 cents again. 
Jenny. It's going to a dollar, boys and girls. Ew. I don't even know what's happening anymore. <laughs> Did I hear a wild Janine there? Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, so I guess I, I have no idea what that massive conversation was. <laughs> I guess uh, we ready to get into the stories today? Yep. Alrighty. So first up, um, two things have happened in the last couple days. Um, Bitcoin Core has merged um, the speedy trial um, implementation based on median time passed uh, five days ago. And in the last day, that has also released um, the first release client. So probably in the next week or so, we are going to see a uh, final release for um, 0.21.1 with the speedy trial activation mechanism for Taproot. And as well, um, on April 15th, um, a BIP8 um, fork of Bitcoin Core with Lot True activated um, was released <clears throat> with myself, um, Bitcoin Mechanic, and a few others um, who have not officially stated they want to have their name as a contributor or supporter to this, um, with some help from Luke Jr., um, forked Bitcoin Core. Um, implemented a block height based um, activation period um, that's going to last 15 months. And in October 2022, if nothing has activated Taproot whatsoever, will um, hit the end of the signal period, um, lock in and start enforcing mandatory signaling like BIP 148 in 2017 um, for all blocks to activate Taproot. Um, so the first thing I want to say, um, if you do not understand what happened in 2017, um, BIP 148, the user activated soft fork, if you don't understand what BIP8 lot true means, um, then you probably should not run um, this BIP8 client. You should just run Bitcoin Core. But if you do understand all of those things and you do understand the reasoning behind um, all the things that happened back then, um, this BIP8 client during the entire speedy trial period will be compatible with Bitcoin Core. And it will be compatible um, all the way until October um, 2022, as long as Bitcoin Core does not release a activation mechanism that is intentionally incompatible with this. And the BIP8 client and Bitcoin Core with the speedy trial activation are both signaling with signal bit two um, for the version bits activation flags. So what this means is, Regardless of miners running core with speedy trial or running this BIP8 client, um, as long as miners are signaling on bit two um, during the speedy trial period, if miner signaling hits the threshold to activate taproot, both Bitcoin core with speedy trial and this BIP8 client will lock in um, activate taproot and start enforcing it together at the same period in November of this year. So in the case that speedy trial is successful, um, both of these will activate in sync, will stay on the same chain, will maintain consensus with each other. So pretty much, um, yeah, I'm going to be running this client. I think there is undeniable um, consensus on activating Taproot itself. And I do not think that upgrades with that type of consensus should be activated in a way that allows some actor in the space, such as miners, to prevent it from actually activating and being enforced on the network. 
And I think that it is a very simple, clear, logical thing to run a BIP8 lock true client like this that does not lock in and activate the user activated soft fork at the end until October of next year. So at the end of speedy trial, there will be a year and a half where that BIP8 client can be activated by miners signaling on BIT2, where Bitcoin Core can release another activation mechanism. And as long as it's signaling with BIT2, it will work in sync with this BIP8 client. And I think it is perfectly reasonable to run something enforcing with that long time horizon in the future that people can rationally think about, react to without being rushed to guarantee that eventually something with consensus will activate. I do not believe miners should have the ability to stall the activation of something with consensus. So if you agree with me, I would encourage you to run this client. If you don't, obviously run Bitcoin Core. Um, if you do not understand these issues and the potential risks that in the unlikely event, speedy trial fails, um, nothing is done until October 2022 to try and activate Taproot in some other way, that this client will start enforcing mandatory signaling to activate Taproot and will split and move off on a different chain from clients that are not enforcing that mandatory signaling. If you do not understand the risks and the choice, then don't run this client, go run Bitcoin Core. But yeah, these are the two options on the table now. Um, make your choice. I personally think that everything is gonna go off fine. Everything will activate Taproot and we can move on from this nonsense and start having longer term discussions um, about activation mechanisms in general. I'd like to wish everybody a happy Opful Retard, and I look forward to Taproot. I look forward to L2 after that. I look forward to signature aggregation. I would love to see these things in our ecosystem so our developers can churn out some real serious applications on top of them. Here, here. I look forward to uh, less dramatic updates on Taproot in my newsletter. <laughs> I mean, I think like this whole fight has been dumb bike shedding where people are just arguing about activation mechanisms instead of the thing everybody wants to turn on. And let, let's just get through the last part of this shit. Let's get Taproot turned on, however that goes. And then there needs to be a serious discussion about how to activate soft forks because th this is just ridiculous that for years, especially amongst users and different communities, there was this hanging consensus and assumption that BIP9 was dead and we were going to be using BIP8 going forward. And then all of a sudden when it came time to turn something on, no, no, and people started arguing over that like i'm not okay with that when this had been a hanging thing for years like that needs to get addressed because that was really fucking ridiculous no matter how you slice it uh i mean from a positive perspective um this is something that andrew polstra said at the mit bitcoin club expo recently that i listened to and he was, I mean, for anyone who maybe wasn't here um, during the Segwit soft fork drama in 2017 and years leading up to that, um, just to remind everyone that from his perspective, uh, there has been a lot less drama <laughs> than the than the Segwit stuff. And also, even better, there has been, um, according to his own uh, metrics, uh, more people participating in review of the code, more people asking questions and getting things like asking for things to be changed or fixed and lots more people testing uh, code as well. So overall, I mean, things, you know, 
I mean, we complain a lot, but honestly, this is like nothing compared to 2016 and 2017. Yeah, I will agree there, but I still think that there are implications and further problems based on how things have gone this time around. All right, that out of the way, though. I do believe a particular nation state is getting very scared of Bitcoin. Yeah, so uh, on April 16th last week, the Associated Press reported that Turkey Central Bank is banning the use of cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin in payments for goods and services, according to a decision published in the country's official Gazette on Friday. Um, and we do have the link to that in the show notes. It is in Turkish, but you can obviously translate it, and I will read some of that uh, in a bit. But uh, according to the Associated Press, the decision comes as many in Turkey have turned to cryptocurrencies to shield their savings from rising inflation and the Turkish currency slump. In a statement explaining its, re its reasons, the bank said transactions carried out through the use of cryptocurrencies present irrevocable risks. Yes, irrevocable risks of uh, realizing that your fiat currency is shit and you never want to go back. <laughs> That's happening a lot. Um, crypto assets are neither, uh, according to them, neither subject to any regulation and supervision mechanisms nor a central regulatory authority. Oh, God, scary. Their market values can be excessively volatile, <laughs> the bank stated. Um, yes, uh, they are excessively volatile when priced in uh, fiat currencies that are rapidly losing value. <laughs> um, it also cited their use in illegal actions due to their anonymous structures and their possible use illegally without the authorization of their holders. Uh, and apparently this restriction will come into effect on April 30th. So if you are someone from Turkey, um, yeah, you can still spend your Bitcoin on stuff legally until April 30th, unless maybe they get this overturned and there's enough protests. But the regulation notice from the Central Bank of Turkey says, uh, according to my English translation of this, um, crypto assets cannot be used directly or indirectly for payments. No service can be provided for direct or indirect use of crypto assets and payments. Crypto assets cannot be used in the provision of payment services and electronic money issuance. Payment service providers cannot develop business models in a way that crypto assets are used directly or indirectly in the provision of payment services and electronic money issuance. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, and then Reuters reported, um, also it says that um, institutions cannot mediate on platforms offering trading, custody, transfer, or issuance services regarding crypto assets or fund transfers from these platforms. So they're not saying that it's not like they're saying you can't have Bitcoin or you can't transact in Bitcoin. They're saying that um, Bitcoin as a way of paying for goods and services is not a legitimate, like it's not a legal uh, medium of exchange anymore. So they're not banning Bitcoin per se. They're just saying it. they won't accept it. Um, like it's not an acceptable way to pay for goods and services. Uh, which some could say is effectively banning it. But um, anyway, Reuters on the same day reported that um, Bitcoin tumbled more than 4% on Friday. Um, as we all know, that is uh, that is a normal Friday in Bitcoin, uh, up or down, after Turkey's central bank banned the use of cryptocurrencies and crypto assets for purchases, citing possible irreparable damage and transaction risks. The decision could stall Turkey's crypto market, which has gained momentum in recent months as investors joined the global rally in Bitcoin, seeking to hedge against lira depreciation and inflation that topped 16% last month. Huh. Uh, coincidence, huh? Bitcoin was down 4.6% at $60,000 uh, uh, after the ban, which was criticized by Turkey's main opposition party. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, central banks going to central bank when people start losing confidence in them. Who knew? Yeah. It sounds a lot like the Nigeria non-ban of a couple weeks back. And I think Bitcoin is in similar status in Russia in that you can't officially use it to buy and sell things, but you can hold it. So it's yeah. interesting that they want to cut the banks out of this market. So it could just be they don't want competition once these banks start offering Bitcoin denominated accounts and such things. It, it could be they think they're, they're stemming the flow away from their currency by not giving people protection in courts for 
contracts that they denominated Bitcoin. Uh, we'll see how long they keep this stance. I just think this is a general shift we're probably going to see in a lot of places um, in terms of reaction to Bitcoin. Um, like, I, I just think we're at the point, like, all these authorities know they cannot just shut this down. It's it's never going to happen. And so I think that the mentality is going to start shifting to you have to accept that. And also, um, Bitcoin, letting people just invest in it, at least, and just use it as that, that investment asset, that is a potential way to deal with all of these governments, like pension liabilities, um, social security or equivalent liabilities, like just general government liabilities that are there to take care of people and get some of that pressure off their back but at the same time they do not want to just get rid of fiat currency they do not want to let that be pushed out and get rid of their taxation authority their ability to print money and deficit spend and so i think a lot of places that are not going to be forward thinking and just embrace this that's going to be the normal reaction like they will allow you to buy it. They will allow you to hold it. They will allow you to sell it and, you know, actually protect your net worth that way. But when it comes to spending money, you're going to use our fucking currency. You're going to use our payment rails. You're going to use the thing that allows us to actually enforce taxation and, um, you know, be able to print money to deficit spend. Yep, and I think that's a good roll into the next three stories or so, as central banks are starting to refer to Bitcoin and stable coins as crypto assets that are alternative investments. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so <laughs> Li Bo, um, a deputy governor of the Central Bank of China, was um, giving a presentation about CBDCs and currencies. Um, and kind of the general point he made there um, was, you know, who cares if it's in a UTXO or account-based system or whatever, the user will never understand those things. Just that it is digital and seamless and that it cannot be used to, like, break the law, launder money, things like that. Like, that's what it should be in reference to their digital um, remimbi pilot. But he also went on to say things like Bitcoin should be used as investment tools or alternate investments and went and made that explicit distinction that these things are not money. They are not tools for making payments, but that he explicitly said they should be available and used for alternative investments. So that exact same kind of attitude, um, like, and from my understanding, that's the standing of, of laws in China. Um, it's the same thing as Russia. Like you're, you're allowed to buy it, invest in it, have it, but it is not money. You can't use it for payments. And you have a figure from the central bank of China now explicitly coming out and reinforcing that situation. Yep, in this case, Li Bo is evidently a deputy governor of the PBOC, and the direct quote from him is, they are not currency per se. And so the main role we see for crypto assets going forward, the main role is investment alternative. Mm -hmm. So it's like, and especially to see a major superpower like that kind of explicitly acknowledge that, like we... We are shifting into like a new phase here. Like they are not treating this like a game or a little curiosity anymore. When you see them looking at, you know, this whole space and trying to normalize and legitimize it as an investment, but specifically attack and undermine its utility as an actual money or means of exchange because that's 
that's going for the throat of their their power as a, a nation state that can tax and deficit spend instead of just kneecapping it a little bit. So one other reason that the Chinese Central Bank commentary was very interesting is the day before uh, the president of the Dallas Fed was at a Texas A&M uh, conference, and I'm not sure if the subject there was Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies in general, but he made some commentaries just the day before this Chinese story dropped. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this was interesting to me because, you know, I, I haven't been following a lot of the uh, different Fed branches. Um like takes on the space so much lately, but you know, it's generally been mostly just the St. Louis fed, um, that has been really on top of things and paying attention to this space in an unbiased way. But yeah, like he, he pretty much outright said like Bitcoin is functional as a store of value. Um, even though it is not, um, quite stable enough or suitable for a medium of exchange. But he, he specifically caveated at the end of that 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 later or that latter fact can change in the future, and you know th this is kind of like this is the most interesting I think an important distinction between how America as a superpower has reacted versus other superpowers like Russia and China, like our tax interpretations definitely disincentivize. Um, the use as a means of exchange. Um, absolutely. But when you see the equivalent American figures talking about this issue, they always are open or kind of specifically caveat the potential that it could change and be a suitable medium of exchange in the future. And I have yet to see, um, at least in an official capacity, I can re recall right now, like very many explicit um, kind of opinions that that should not be allowed. Like that's generally been like loudmouth idiot congressmen getting money coming in from the, the right people. Um, not so much like these figures in the, the financial institutions. Yeah, what was interesting here to me is this is the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas president, Robert Kaplan. So he's head of one of these, I believe there are 13 uh, Federal Reserve areas. So he's the top of one of these and people at that level rotate on to the Board of Governors and that sort of thing. Uh, his quote was, right now it's clear it's a store of value. It's, uh, it obviously moves a lot in value, which can keep it from spreading too far as a medium of exchange and wide adoption, but that can change. So these guys see it. They, they are watching Bitcoin. And uh, to relate that to yet another central bank, a uh, story dropped about the Bank of England uh, doing what all these central banks have announced lately, which is studying central bank digital currencies and they make a nice little uh reference to bitcoin in there which i i always like to see just to kind of read the sentiment uh the bank said avoiding the risks of new forms of private money creation including cryptocurrencies such as bitcoin is one of the reasons it is investigating its own digital currency it said if a CBDC were to be introduced, it would be denominated in pounds sterling, aka fiat, just like banknotes. So 10 pounds of CBDC would always be worth the same as a 10 pound note, they say. Um, that is interesting coming from that bank because a comment like that precludes this idea of being able to do something like, say, negative interest rates on central bank digital currency, which are definitely possible when the central bank owns the database. But making comments like that sound like commitments to not having that in place. So uh, always interesting for these guys to come out and, and make their commentaries because CBDCs can be anything they program them to be. And it's going to be a political issue for us to make sure if they issue a CBDC, it is as good as cash in whatever uh, way we want to make sure it's as good as cash. 
Yeah, I think any intelligent Western nation is very wary of the idea of disintermediating private um, finance institutions too hard. Like, though, especially like the UK, the US, like that is just way too big a percent of our overall economy. Yep, those banks are essentially their constituents. And if you try to put them out of business, they will perhaps try to put you out of business. They could turn around and denominate accounts in Bitcoin. Uh, they could turn around and do any number of things. They could launch their own stable coin and go away from bank reserves altogether. Uh, their options are many. Mm -hmm. So Canada did a thing. Oh, yeah. Good old Canada. Just absolutely smoking us down here in the U.S. lately. So Canada has what? Some like three Bitcoin ETFs at this point. Well, now they have one more. And this one's special. This is an inverse daily performance ETF. So Horizons Beta Pro inverse Bitcoin ETF will provide up to 100% the inverse daily performance of an index that, according to their statement, replicates the returns generated over time through exposure to long notional investments in Bitcoin futures. Uh, they're going to charge a 1.45% management fee, and they are also planning on having a sister ETF that is just a regular uh, not so inverse Bitcoin ETF. So Canada is up by at least four ETFs on us. And, you know, I really take solace in this because any of the, the guys into stocks, into gold, and having brokerage accounts, if you want to bet against Bitcoin now, it is super easy. Horizon Beta Pro inverse Bitcoin ETF. So if you want to be a beta pro, get out there. I don't want to be a beta. I want to be an alpha. Then you best hold some Pepe cash. That was just a, I don't know. I, I see the weird thing is like the, the simplification of like what I do or what I talk about is financial technology, but there is so much financial lingo that just whoop goes right over my Head, I don't understand anything about what he just said. <laughs> Pretty yep. much. So, is isn't this like TLDR um, the place where morons can go to short Bitcoin now? Yep, this will supposedly give you the inverse of Bitcoin's price performance. So, if you think we're going to have a ten thousand dollar down candle today, you can buy this product and you will make $10,000 instead of lose $10,000. So it's effectively a way to short Bitcoin. So in short, Canada is doing better at freedom than America. They're just running all over our concept of freedom lately in that financial space. It's mind blowing though, cause like they're, they're doing freedom right for things like this, but then with other things, they're being like total lunatic fascists. <laughs> yeah, no Ontario news on the news desk here, but supposedly they killed a proposal that would allow policemen to stop you and ask where you're going, any of you, out on any road in Canada, just to make sure you were staying safe. Something that I learned recently, I, I would never have learned this as a person who doesn't drive cars, but apparently, I don't know if this is... A federal law or a state law that is maybe common but apparently there are places in the u.s possibly all of the u.s where apparently you can get pulled over for having an air freshener hanging from your mirror because it is technically illegal to have anything hanging from your mirror in your car that could possibly obscure your vision so technically air fresheners that hang from mirrors are illegal products and i'm just like what yeah, supposedly that's what started the whole process of that man getting shot with not a taser in Minnesota uh, not so long ago. If you want to really get a deep dive about how weird the legal books are in the U.S. at least, there is an amazing uh, Twitter account called A Crime A Day, which I recommend to everyone because some of the laws are just hilariously weird. Um, some of them don't make sense. And yeah. Yep. 
I mean, it is a tangled mess of 200 years of slapping on reactions to random shit that never go away. Like, I, I would bet you serious money that a bunch of towns in Southern America probably still have laws on the books about not being able to fire off a cannon too close to downtown because it was obnoxious and loud. Yeah, the person who runs the Crime A Day Twitter account also is the author of a book that I believe the title is something along the lines of How to Become a Federal Criminal, which is amazing. Like, can you imagine you're just at someone's house and you see a book on their table with that title? <laughs> it's easier than you think. <laughs> so easy that you don't even know you're doing it, literally. Yep. All right, should we talk about this hash rate drop that we saw over the past couple days? Yeah. I didn't see anything, but I saw a lot of people talking about it, so... <laughs> well, this is actually a couple things happening in succession. And I do want to clarify here that for the most part, um, consider anything I say except actual blockchain statistics and data not fully confirmed. But um, apparently in Xinjiang, um, in China, which is, I think, the second biggest concentration of hash rate in China, um, had a massive explosion at a coal mine. And I'm assuming that alone probably put potential coal supply to power plants um, into a situation where a lot of logistics juggling had to happen. But they also apparently um, triggered a bunch of shutdowns at plants and facilities all over the area for safety inspections. And when this happened, um, in the raw um, short-term data and from some reports directly from mining pools, um, saw a massive drop, um, somewhere from 30 to 40% in hash rate, just in the very short term raw data, um, not looking at the actual averages done over time. And yeah. Um, so first off, um, this data kind of implies to me that the supposed hash rate migration um, from China to other parts of the world um, has potentially been wildly over-exaggerated given that the amount of hash rate lost here is pretty in line with some of the um, hash rate distribution estimates in China from like I think around two years ago. Um, so that's something to consider. And then as well, um, shortly after that, um, apparently a whale deposited 9,000 Bitcoin um, on Binance. And shortly after that, um, a massive sell-off occurred that triggered almost $5 billion in liquidations. And that seems to be a big part of why the uh, price just completely nosedived yesterday or the other day. And um, so far, it looks like a lot of the hash rate is starting to come back online in short-term um, data. But the, the one thing I want to point out about that is little short-term shifts like that um, are not in and of themselves really indicative of anything. Um, that potentially could have happened. Um, like we could have just had a random period of blocks coming in very far apart because that's kind of random. And that's just something to consider when seeing you know, stuff like this happen and people freaking out about changes in hash rate. And also um, another thing is people freak out about mining profitability, but think through what happens when a lot of hash rate disappears. Blocks come in over longer intervals. They take longer to be found. 
So the mempool builds up. Fees go up. Um, hash rate disappearing does not just only make minor revenue disappear. The dynamics of the fee market and the mempool in these situations tend to actually bring up the available fee income and balance out more than just, you know, miners are always making less in those situations. Yep. Those still mining are still getting their rewards. It's just, it's harder to find a block now. But yeah, the two main takeaways uh, I would say is people should understand these things well enough to not freak out over short-term things like that. And, um, yeah, this is a self-adjusting system. Like everything worked exactly like it was supposed to, as this incident occurred. Congrats to anybody who got a really good stink bit film. <laughs> Alrighty though, this, uh, this next one is really curious, Janine. Yeah, I haven't had enough time to completely go through it and check it, but um, just having read through it, it seems a uh, cursor cursorily uh, uh, based on I don't know, uh, my brain is not working today. Just based on my initial reading, it seems to check out. Um, but basically, a guy named Joshua Davis from a project called Tanda Pay has published a very long post in Coin Monks regarding how the FBI has handled Bitcoin funds that were seized via asset forfeiture in at least one case, and likely very many. He writes, When the federal authorities seize funds in a forfeiture, you would think that transparency would be a high priority for the sake of the victims. You would be wrong. The FBI now routinely uses Bitcoin mixers both before and after seizure, which completely contradicts the opinion of the DOJ. This procedure means that the victims must blindly trust that the FBI, um, as they have no way of verifying exactly how much funds the FBI actually seized from the criminals. It also makes it very difficult for other law enforcement agencies to audit the FBI when they take possession of the illicit funds. And I should also mention that this... Uh, I'm reading kind of chunks that I think are the most interesting, but the the beginning of the post uh, actually cited the Silk Road case uh, with the two corrupt um, government agents. One who I think was a um, he was Secret Service, and the other one was from the DEA, so not the FBI. But it, he cited the case as an example of government agents um, mishandling Bitcoin funds. Um, so, the rest of this article will examine a specific case where the FBI's use of a Bitcoin mixer provides no known benefit, either for the victims who are eligible for remission or for law enforcement itself. On August 1st, 2018, the FBI seized uh, about 39 Bitcoin from Ahmed Wagafi Herod in Tuscan, Arizona, for forfeiture pursuant to string of numbers and letters for U.S. law. The same forfeiture amount of 39 Bitcoin later appears in an indictment against Mr. Herod and Ms. Matthew Jean Dittman. They were later convicted of committing unauthorized SIM swaps to steal and extort cryptocurrency from victims. They operated as part of a group that specialized in tricking and bribing representatives at the major wireless providers into giving them control over phone numbers belonging to people who the thieves later targeted for extortion and theft. Uh, the Money Laundering and Asset Recovery Section, M-L-R-A-M-L-A-R-S, which, by the way, should mention that the uh, guy who is now the deputy, no, not the deputy, the chief of the uh, of FinCEN, uh, recently appointed, I think on April 11th, who also used to uh, work for Chain Analysis, briefly, Chain Analysis, briefly, uh, he also was once in the uh, money laundering and asset re asset recovery section. Interesting, huh? Um, yeah. So this uh, section that the DOJ manages um, is uh, they manage the FBI's asset forfeiture program. Also, isn't it interesting that Chainalysis also has a program to help government agencies uh, with asset forfeiture related to cryptocurrencies? Um, 
this is all just me commenting, but continues. Uh, this includes distributing forfeited funds and adjudicating petitions for the remission of forfeited assets. The FBI sends out updates to victims, and recently the victims of Herod and Dittman were asked by the FBI to submit their petitions for remission in light of their convictions. Unfortunately, the way the FBI listed these funds in their database made it seem as if the cryptocurrency had already been sold. When the seizure notice was sent out in 2018, the FBI claimed that it had 39.67 and other uh, numbers, Bitcoin. But recently, when the victims filled out their form online, the FBI claimed that it had a financial instrument, virtual currency, valued at $255,000, which is exactly 85% of the value listed at the time of the seizure. The FBI takes his cut of 15% before it gives the victims anything. Now, this was, uh, he made a correction later that there wasn't actually a conversion, um, but this is his assumption upon seeing these differences in numbers, which is why some of the victims felt that the clerical error in the FBI's system implied that the asset had been sold shortly after it was seized. 34 Bitcoin the victims believed they were entitled to would be worth $2 million at the time of writing. 255,000 versus 2 million is one hell of a clerical error. And according to his analysis and research of um, the blockchain data involved, he determined that the source of the weirdness in this clerical error was that the FBI had been moving the funds through a tumbler. And further, the FBI chose to tumble these funds at literally the most expensive time in the past five years or ever, his words. Um, to be 100% clear, the FBI does not need a money transmitter license to act as a lawful Bitcoin tumbler. Government agencies are exempt from needing to obtain a money services business license. Convenient. However, I'd like to humbly point out that uh, uh, the law requires funds to be safeguarded against waste, lost, uh, loss, unauthorized use, or misappropriation. The question of what constitutes waste is a crucial one. The FBI has custody of victims' funds, but it would not be appropriate to pay fees in excess of a certain threshold to obfuscate transactions. I have no idea of what this threshold might be, but obfuscating transactions through a Tumblr typically incurs additional transaction fees paid to miners. These fees are two to, fee uh, two to five times higher than they would be if the transaction was not obfuscated. Why should the victims be required to pay access fees to Bitcoin miners? These fees are deducted from the total available funds, which were seized at the time of forfeiture, so the victims cannot get them back. It is very expensive to tumble Bitcoin, and the victims never ask the FBI to use their funds in this way. So I have one very important question here. Um, were they just running their own Tumblr, or were they using somebody else's custodial, centralized mixer because if it's the latter the fbi was just sending bitcoin they seized off to some random dude on the internet who could totally have just stolen it and never given them coins back so i haven't looked at the data uh closely enough to i mean he does mention like um tumblr type services that have had a lot of bitcoin go through them but that was mostly determining like oh look it has the similar transaction pattern to this so it's not clear if the fbi was running their own tumblr or if they were using someone else's either could be possible um i don't know at this point it's not that was not stated in the article it's interesting to me that they would feel like they would need to obscure those funds for purposes other than agents stealing those funds, uh, first of all, because these are public known addresses. Uh, they come into FBI custody and hopefully they leave FBI custody to go back to whoever rightfully owns those funds. So I wouldn't expect that to be more than a potentially too hot process. So that's interesting. Another interesting thing in this article was it brought up a couple of the most popular Bitcoin addresses in terms of transaction throughput and how many Bitcoin has been through them. Uh, one of which was Satoshi Dice's, uh, one of which belonged to, I think, a different Bitcoin exchange. And then they show this FBI address that has had more Bitcoin come through it than either of those other two addresses, which is kind of mind blowing. Because mm -hmm. I mean, like that, that to me just says they're using somebody else's Tumblr unless the FBI has just been operating some of the biggest centralized mixers in the space for years. 
I mean, so, it's uh, it's uh, it's not outside the realm of possibility. <laughs> but you're gonna miss. It's like one of those two things. Either law enforcement authorities are running some of those mixers, or whoever decided to do this at the FBI is so idiotic that they literally just sent seized Bitcoin worth millions to a random custodial thing that could have just stolen them. Yeah, I mean, you would hope that they, I mean, again, because this is funds that they seized, obviously with the eventual intent to return them to the people. I mean, this, this is an actual case where there was asset seized because there was a known victim. There are obviously asset forfeiture programs, as many people well know in the U.S., where there is no victim and assets and property are seized kind of on an arbitrary basis. In fact, uh, I think the amount of theft that occurs in the United States by policemen and other law enforcement agencies is more than theft by non-law enforcement agents, uh, last I checked. So it's a very rampant problem. Uh, in this case, there was asset forfeiture on the basis that there actually were victims. It was funds that were taken from people through a scam. Uh, but yeah, like... I, I just, again, uh, I emphasize his point about what is the benefit of tumbling the funds. Like, it, this, isn't an, <laughs> this isn't an instance where I, 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 like, I don't see what, privacy, what privacy has to do with this. Like, sure, on the one hand, if everyone was tumbling coins and that was just the thing that everyone using Bitcoin did, that would be one thing, but it's not common enough yet. So, like, I just don't, I don't see... I don't see what the benefit is. And also, again, they reduce the amount of funds that are available to victims. They were not funds that, like, they shouldn't have done that knowing that, you know, this is, it's not like a secret that there are fees to certain types of Bitcoin transactions uh, or Bitcoin transactions in general. You know the fee. So this was, like, grossly irresponsible of them to do this, especially without consulting the people whose money it actually was, like, what the hell? Mm -hmm. We're watching you, FBI. Also, another point, I didn't really highlight it, but part of the article goes into, like, this is hypocrisy because not only does the DOJ and other U.S. government agencies say and imply all the time that using a mixer is somehow a marker of, of illicit activity, like it's not illegal, but it's a marker of something illicit or scary or criminal maybe happening. Um, like, again, like, if, if they're going to use it, is this just, again, a case where a government can do something and it's not a crime, but when an ordinary person does it, it's a crime? Like... The difference is obviously that when a lot of individuals are using mixers and coin join and things like that, they're doing it to actually protect their privacy uh, because they want that. But one, why would the FBI want that in a situation like this? And also, why do they feel the need to do it in general? Just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Something funny is afoot. Alrighty then. So, I think it's time for Shinobi to eat crow. Is it? Yeah, I'd say it's about that time. So, the other day, uh, MicroStrategy um, filed some more SEC documents. And in this filing, um, they specifically brought up the fact that they had been investigating um, the potential for different um, chain analysis functions and integrating that into their products. Well, to be really clear, they did not use the term chain analysis, especially not the was company. It blockchain they said, analytics. Yes, blockchain analytics, which is like it was one sentence and yeah. But yeah, um, let's just say I have been suspecting for a bit um, the potential for 
micro strategy to get into chain analytics um, and saw Bitcoin Magazine publish this and immediately jumped to assuming I was correct here. When in reality, as um, Michael Saylor clarified shortly after, everyone started freaking out that all they had been doing is essentially looking for market indicators that they could pull from analyzing the blockchain that might um, incentivize big money players to get involved in Bitcoin. And that ultimately, so far, they've found absolutely nothing that they could actually monetize or turn into a service. Um, so, yep, um, Shinobi, like many people, um, jump to conclusions way too fast here. But I do want to say, despite that, I still don't see Michael Saylor getting vocal or really being against the existence of chain analytics companies, especially given his general attitude about this space is pretty much um, just hold, um, borrow against, and go use things like PayPal to spend stuff. Um, just spend fiat instead. And Matt O'Dell got out of him um, off of the latest uh, Why Are We Bullish? That MicroStrategy doesn't even self-custody their own coins. So, yeah. Um, in this particular instance, I was totally wrong. I eat crow on that. But I still do not think that in the end sailor's attitude about a lot of stuff in this space is necessarily going to align with a lot of the rest of ours his company's core competency is data dashboarding for business analytics i believe so i could see why he would be interested in blockchain based data and potentially delivering that to people uh it's just are you developing blockchain based data sources a la Glassnode uh, for people to trade and see activity, see interesting things uh, that is known about blockchain data? Or are you doing chain analytics and trying to track specific entities through the chain? There's a whole gamut of things you can do if you're doing blockchain analytics. Yeah, I mean, I'm like, I'm still suspicious of him, even though I think this, you know, it wasn't it wasn't a super big focus of the SEC filing. So, you know, the fact that they mentioned it, and again, like, I mean, technically, block explorers that we all use and enjoy and are useful technically do blockchain analytics. So there's kind of a broad, this is why I kind of, you know, in my presentations, I make the distinction between even though a lot of actual blockchain surveillance companies don't do this, they use the term blockchain analytics, and I think that's part of the problem here. But I do try to make the distinction between blockchain analytics and blockchain surveillance. And sometimes there is kind of a murky gray area where it's not clear which one it is. But for me, blockchain surveillance is definitely uh, the part where you're specifically doing the blockchain analysis as um, either someone in power or as a lackey of someone in power where you are doing it for law enforcement purposes. Like that is the purpose of the blockchain analytics and most, most, you know, block explorers, they're just providing data to people so that they can look up whether their transaction was confirmed or something like that. Like they're not doing it for law enforcement purposes, even though technically you could, someone could use it for that. But I make that distinction, and so it's not it's not super clear to me from the filing that like what the intent is. I'm still suspicious based on you know MicroStrategy's general history. I do also want to point out that I saw back at the beginning of the month there was some kind of clubhouse chat that he was in with some Bitcoin people, and according to Brad Mills, um, he asked him in this clubhouse chat about his stance on surveillance and Michael Saylor said, I am not pro surveillance. And then Brad says he went on a 10 minute giga chad monologue about how censorship, the censorship resistant properties of Bitcoin, including coin join, make it a superior asset to anything else. So yeah, I mean, that's interesting for him. You know, he is, I guess, praising 
privacy features. I don't know how genuine that is or how much he actually knows about that. Uh, whether maybe that's just a way for him to kind of divert criticism or attention on maybe his interest in doing blockchain surveillance related stuff. But yeah, I'm just kind of suspicious and uh but there are some signs that are kind of counter claims to this idea that that is his intent i guess well i'm not saying it's so much an intent just he wouldn't be against it and i mean if he's made statements like that well how do you reconcile that with him constantly saying if you want to make payments just use paypal yeah i mean there are there again in general i'm not like a fan of his and i think largely he's just a rich guy who discovered that he could make a ton of money by buying bitcoin and yeah sure he said some things that i guess a lot of bitcoin maximalists like but i just i'm not i am not super impressed like yeah he's a guy with money and he bought bitcoin and he's made money that's cool but like i i don't really care and i'm actually concerned about the fact that a, com a single company is buying so much of the supply it's a free market but you know i just i'm not a fan of him like a lot of people are so i'm not saying that you know i'm not i'm not a fan of his or that i'm picking a side i just in general don't value his opinions that much from what i've seen Mm -hmm. As, but you know end of the day I gotta eat crow on this specific incident but yeah I still am not sure he is gonna come around to the same thought process as a lot of people listening to this in the end speaking of eating crow though I think a bunch of people are getting ready to shove one down someone else's throat Really quick, do we uh, actually know who he's, who he and or MicroStrategy is custodying with? Um, if I remember correctly, I think the implication was Coinbase. Oh God, gross. Yeah. No, thank you. A lot of times. Uh the finance guys have to have counterparties on their assets uh, or they have to have very significant plans in place and approved by all sorts of risk managers to do it themselves. And he covered some of that in that podcast when he talked about it, but I don't think he said specifically, but I think Coinbase institutional custody was implied. Giga Chad, a true Giga Chad would self custody, but that is my opinion. He'll get there. He's going to be in a position to fund a bank here one of these years. So we'll see how Mr. Sailor evolves. But yeah, something else icky. I, I just, I always kind of, I don't know, it makes me kind of laugh to myself that, you know, a lot of us are doing something that like, even the, even the super rich people are like not comfortable doing, which is self-custodying funds. Yeah, it's it's different when you have fiduciary duty because um, they're not just his coins; they're his shareholders' value. So you, you have sure, to have a lot of process on that. I I mean, yeah, I can. From I mean, yeah, companies are companies, but like, I'm assuming he must also have some personal funds, and like, I don't know, who knows what he's doing with those? Is that all? Like, did he say this is only MicroStrategy, or did he also mention any of his personal stuff, like what he's doing with that? It, it was just about micro strategies holding, not his uh, personal oh, coins. Okay. Yeah. So, well, I don't know. I, I feel like if he chose Coinbase for institutional, I don't know. I don't have much confidence in his personal choices either. <laughs> Guys like that are going to be in a good bargaining position to bounce from Coinbase to Fidelity to Gemini to whoever State Street that offers them the best rate going forward. So, It'll be fun to see how the institutional custody thing evolves too, because we now have legit finance players that aren't just the coin bases of the world who will offer services like this. Yep. All right, the third transition nudge is the charm. Icky bad man. Copa suing Craig Wright. Craig oh, Wright. right. <laughs> 
that yeah there are so many icky bad men i wasn't sure who you're talking about <laughs> um so yeah i mean this is pretty short um because i have not looked up any court documents on this but basically the cryptocurrency open patent alliance or copa which was formed uh around the end of last year and was discussed by us here a few times like in episodes 237 and 257 as they say in their bio if you're not familiar with them they're just a non-profit uh community uh, or membership organization that seeks to remove patents and litigation as a barrier to growth in crypto and who better to uh fight than the biggest patent troll ever fake toshi um, on April 12th, COPA announced that they had initiated a lawsuit um, asking the UK High Court to declare that Mr. Craig Wright does not have copyright ownership over the Bitcoin white paper. We stand in support of the Bitcoin developer community and the many others who have been threatened for hosting the white paper. Thank you, COPA. Not that I have uh, too much confidence in the UK uh, judicial system given other cases but uh yeah this would be a positive development um given also that the uk is the jurisdiction where uh i don't know if he's still doing this but at one point uh craig wright was claiming to be a lawyer in the uk when he definitely is not and that is illegal in the uk that would be a nice court case to open i wonder if anyone will do that mm -hmm. this is one thing i will definitely support the industry alliances championing which is getting rid of false claims in the court system and going after people who oppose false claims. Mm -hmm. And like, th this is a serious problem too, because like his like legal trolling is at the point where it is quite literally something that developers will consider before they decide to do or not do a thing. Like they, they, a lot of devs are quite literally at this point, like asking themselves semi regularly, like if I were to do this thing, could that open me to a baseless lawsuit from this lunatic? So, like, yeah, that every once in a while, good things, the right thing happens. This is one of those times because that is developers have enough shit and pressure to deal with besides some moron like craig just throwing money around to drag people into court for bullshit wouldn't it be nice if we could go back to the very 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 early days of our awareness of anyone by the name of craig wright existing when he was still saying that he didn't want public attention and wanted to have a private life <laughs> yes like there, I, I believe I did not delete it. I literally, there is still a tweet that exists for me. I think in 2015, when um, there was that article about how oh he, he the uh, the Australian government might have arrested him and he got out at a Satoshi. And believe it or not, I felt bad for him. And that tweet still exists, where I felt bad for Craig Wright in one tweet many years ago. Um, <laughs> obviously, that is completely gone now. Go back to being a lawyer, Mr. Wright. Wonder how pissed Calvin will be at the end of all of this, realizing he bankrolled a big fat money sink. As Julian Assange once said, who cares about your amateur opinions? <laughs> On literally anything, including law or Bitcoin. Yep. So I guess are we ready for some positive news? Oh, yes. So, um, March 31st, um, Lightning Strike uh, opened up support for users in El Salvador. And, um, yeah, in the last two weeks, um, new registrations and user growth has exploded. And... Lightning Strike is now the number one financial app in all of El Salvador. So, yeah, um, this is fucking awesome. Um, yeah, it's a KYC platform. If you are the binary thinker that will just shriek, there is no positive to that, feel free to do so right now. But... He has just plugged an entire country that has a lot of financial infrastructure 
and currency problems into a Bitcoin native neobank where they can get cheap access to financial services. And I'm unaware if this is actually deployed um, yet in the back end, but you know, when we had Jack on um, to talk about this when um, the last time he was on, they were planning stablecoin integration so that people in a country like El Salvador could not only have access to the Bitcoin payment rails, w withdraw that as Bitcoin if they want, but also um, have a direct um, stablecoin claim that they could uh, hold dollars in or something as a fiat alternative, more stable, better performing than their own currency. Like plugging this type of infrastructure into these areas in the world this is how you start the first domino in wide scale payment use for this type of shit. Like beyond the you are doing something people tell you you can't do. And this is just mind blowing. In two weeks, it has become the number one finance app in that entire country. Yeah, and I think the quote was Ecuador is something like number seven in global remittances or else in remittances out of the U.S. Uh, in terms of country rankings. So this is not small potatoes. I mean, it's, it's just awesome. Like, get this shit rolling out. And once it's rolled out everywhere people can start working on hooking in the non-custodial like adapters to shit like this. And that is where things will start getting crazy. Thanks for building the rails, Jack. So I guess um, last up, scary news. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, this one's uh, kind of fun. So it was announced fun. this week there is a malware out there. Uh, the news is that the malware has essentially been ported to the newest version of macOS, Big Sur, and the newest versions of Safari. Uh, so it can now run on or specifically targets Apple's uh, M1-based Macintoshes. So this, this is kind of fun. This is the XCSS set uh, malware. Uh, these, uh, the description of this malware is XCSS set modules come with the capabilities to steal credentials, capture screenshots, inject malicious JavaScript into websites, plunder user data from different apps, and even encrypt files for ransom. Uh, in addition to trojanizing Safari to exfiltrate data, the malware is also known for exploiting the remote debugging modes in other browsers, such as Google Chrome, Brave, Microsoft Edge, Mozilla Firefox, Opera, uh, Quaihu 360 browser, and Yandex browser to carry out cross-site scripting attacks. Uh, what's more, the malware now even attempts to steal account information from multiple websites, including cryptocurrency trading platforms such as Huobi, Binance, InningCall.net, Avato, and 163.com. So it sounds like this has been an existing problem, and essentially uh, the stubs for this are getting snuck into Xcode projects, uh, which are is the default Apple build system that Apple ships build tools for. And once this uh, sneaks into a project, it downloads and installs patches to Safari that specifically allows taking over a number of things in that and evidently enable these debug modes in other browsers and stealing information. So kind of like uh, the PHP attack we saw uh, not so long ago, but um, definitely one of those things that is insidious in that uh, a developer checking out uh, a random uh, repo that they wouldn't expect to be able to negatively impact them may well be rooting their system. 
Yeah, so pretty much if you are going to build an application for Mac platforms, um, get the SDK directly from Apple, dummy. And I guess now you also have to be wary of some of the imports in random projects you may pull up from the internet. Mm -hmm. What part of the stack of computing will be fucked up next week? Tune in to find out. Alrighty then. I guess that brings us to final thoughts time. Well, it's interesting how uniform stuff is. You know, we see almost all these central banks react in very similar ways in terms of CBDCs. We see stuff like the US and China message the exact same thing about the legitimacy of digital assets uh, within days of each other. Yep. Times are changing. My final thought is uh, just a kind of another Assange update, not too much news lately but there was a live event uh two days ago called the international symposium of parliamentarians and basically it was members of parliament from several countries including the uk and australia and i believe also belgium france ireland uh and a few others and basically it was members of parliament so people making decisions in governments in these countries uh on behalf of their citizens, supposedly in a democracy, talking about how they cared about the Assange case and they are horrified about what's happening in the UK and the case and the prison conditions that he's being subjected to. And uh, it was just, I don't know, I recommend people to watch it because if anyone thinks that the only people who are interested in this case that maybe you don't care about are journalists or activists or what have you, technologists, uh, that is not true. There are actual members of governments who care and they are also horrified by this and they are trying to change it and actually having a hard time despite being members of parliament. So if you happen to live in a country that has something like a parliament and you have members that uh, you can reach out to and maybe are Holden to listen to your opinions, maybe you should contact them and they can become part of this group that is actively trying to basically get kind of a coalition together to, um, apparently they mentioned that they wanted to actually travel to the US and campaign there as, you know, mostly European members of parliament. Um, so, and there also have been in the past US congressmen, like, Tulsi and others who have expressed support. So uh, if you, you know, not a big fan of government, but if you do have the option to talk to your member of parliament and you live in a country that has one of those, maybe you could express your opinion about that and see if they are aware of this and maybe could join in the conversation. You're here. And I guess my final thought for American listeners in big cities. I think now is about the time everyone should start considering that we might get another summer of love. Run. Keep it peaceful. So, hope everybody get out while enjoyed. You can. <laughs> hope everybody enjoyed, including the long 30 something minute random conversation at the beginning. And, uh, Catch you later, punks. Bye-bye. Peace out. No cats today.